the uh, story that we just, uh, uh, Roy, a family, so much. I, I've seen it, seen it happen, and it is so preventable, and, and it's so sad the way it can affect you, your children, and and so many other people. So we want to just talk about, you know, how can we gain victory over this? It's it is doable. My dictionary defines bitterness as strong feelings of hatred and resentment. So the first thing we need to understand is that bitterness is a serious sin. You got these strong feelings of resentment and hatred. Okay, that's that's sin. Just to have those kind of feelings. Scriptures say, "Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. But be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you." And I think we all know that that's that's how we are to live as Christians. Saying it and doing it are, are often <laughs> not. It's not as easy to do it as it is to say it. It's, it's easy to know the right thing, a little harder to do it. Now, we're first going to be talking about, with regard to bitterness, uh, a totally innocent person who's been wrong, who has no fault uh, in it at all. This might be the victim of a crime, or maybe sexual abuse, or, or, or something like that, or physical abuse. Um, I think uh, one of the brothers here was, you know, a child at one of the Catholic schools and was, you know, physically abused there and, and been a lot of other children that, that way. Um, maybe you've been physically injured because of somebody else's negligence, not your fault at all, and somebody else was careless, and as a result, maybe you're uh, laid up for life or something like that, or it's cost you a, a lot of money. Maybe your uh, friends or, or family you feel have been uh, unfair to you, maybe have deserted you when, when they should have stuck by you, or, or maybe you were in a church or, or sect that was uh, very severe and, and harsh, and you have some scars from, from that. There's, there's a number of things like that that people go through. Um, now, we're going to be mentioning later, and the story talked about that, that uh, people who are bitter, uh, probably most of the time they're not totally innocent persons, but sometimes they, they, they are. And we're going to just first start off just assuming uh, the bitter person is uh, totally innocent in the matter. <coughs> then we're going to be talking about the fact that uh, so often that, that person is involved in it as well. Okay, we're going to look at seven steps in overcoming bitterness. The first one is recognizing that bitterness is a choice. That we have the ability to respond however we choose to a wrong done to us. We may not have any choice to stop the wrong from being done to us, but we have a choice as to how we are going to respond. Uh, one person, this isn't uh, uh, original with me, uh, so when we look at the word responsibility, this is probably not the grammatical uh, uh, way that it came about. Maybe it is, I don't know. Uh, you have two words, response and ability. That you have the ability to choose your response. Somebody else can do something to you, but they can't force you to respond in a certain way. When Gandhi was leading the, the fight against the British, it wasn't a physical fight, it was a resistance, uh, nonviolent uh, resistance. Uh, he's not a Christian hero or anything like that, but he said something that's very true. He said, they cannot take away our self-respect if we do not give it to them. And it's the same way with bitterness. Nobody can force you to be bitter if you don't let it happen. That is totally on you. It might be a natural response. But um, you don't have to let somebody take your joy away from you. So that's step one. Step two is understanding why God allows us to suffer, why he allows us to be wrong. Now that could be, you know, a several hour message in itself. We're not going to look at uh, the entire uh, discussion of that. 
But when we're born again, there's, there's two things that you might say we receive. Uh, one is we receive forgiveness for all of our past sins when that, when that happens, when we're born again. The second thing we receive is a cross. And that's not often talked about in, in many uh, salvation sermons. But Jesus told, told you, just for the sake of time, I'm, I'm going to just read these scripture passages. Um, I think you all trust me that I'm reading from the uh, scriptures. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. So he promises us a cross. If we're a true follower of Jesus, in one way or another, and it may be in many ways, but we're going to be carrying a cross. And uh, if there's no, I think it was William Penn who said, no cross, no crown. And uh, we, we cannot expect to follow Jesus and not have any crosses to bear. You can't expect to be part of a congregation and not have crosses. I mean, there's just too many imperfect people. We're going to rub each other the wrong way. We're going to uh, sometimes gossip about uh, one another. Not that we're excusing that, but it, it, it happens. We, we sometimes are, are misunderstood. There's just a lot of things that, that go wrong in a congregation. And I say go wrong. It's not that something really went wrong or went out of kelter. It's, it's the way it Jesus knew it would be because we are imperfect people. And so church life is always going to be imperfect life. If you're looking for perfection, you're not going to find that in any church, whether it's this congregation or anywhere else. You can keep moving your whole life, and it's always going to be there. Not only that, God promises that he's going to test us to see how genuine our faith is. So when a cross comes, when a trial comes, when a wrong has been done to us, you know, we can get bitter, or we can look at this as, hey, this is a test. It doesn't mean that God necessarily, specifically caused this person to do something wrong to us. God doesn't do evil things, but he has allowed it to happen, uh, often just to see what our response is going to be. We have the case of Job. God didn't actually bring all the evil things on Job. It was Satan, but God allowed it in order to see just what Job was made out of, he was pretty sure how it would turn out, and it turned out that, that way. But James said, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So the crown of life is promised to those who love God. And if we follow Jesus Christ in life, he told us, we will have a cross to carry. We will have people just like us. And sometimes we're at fault in that, and often it's merely because we are a Christian. But one way or the other, it's going to be happening. And somehow, though, our, our cross can seem so heavy when in reality it's, it's a rather light thing. I heard a story totally... Uh, it's a parable. Um, many, many years ago, I don't even know who, who, uh, who first came up with the illustration, but uh, uh, there was this man who was just uh, crying out to God. He was just so weighted down with the cross that he was having to carry in, in life. And uh, he prayed to God, please, could you give me a different cross to carry than what I've been having to carry all of these years? And God finally decided to answer his prayer and said, all right, I'll give you a different cross. Well, an angel came to this, this man and, and uh, led him to this place. It went way up, who knows where, in the, in the clouds, and they eventually came to this big palace up there. And uh, the man came there, lifting his, his heavy cross, barely getting to the, to the door of the, of the palace, and then some angels came out, and uh, 
the accompanying angel asks one of the others, would you please take this man's cross off, off of his back? We're going to give him another cross. So the angels came and took it off his back and uh, carried it away. He didn't see where, where they took it. Uh, and then the other angel leads him inside. And he starts going down this hall, and the angel says, now, we're going to go down several halls. In each room, you're going to see a cross. And you can just pick whichever one you want. And we'll find a cross that'll, that'll fit you. And the man says, well, that sounds really good. I'm so tired of carrying the one that I've had. So they go to the first room, and there was this big wooden cross made out of oak, uh, taller than I am, uh, blood stains on it. And the man looks at that and says, no, I don't think that's the cross I want. The angel said, that's fine. We'll go to the next room. Well, there, there's one of these big stone crosses that you see here in Ireland uh, all, all over. And the man looks at the massive weight of that and says, uh, no, if, if I can pass on this one, I'd like to. And the angel said, oh, you're fine. There's, there's plenty to choose from. They go to the next room. There's a big iron cross as high as this, this ceiling. Wrought iron, black. And he says, no, I don't think I want that cross either. Well, they keep going down the hall. Every door, he says, no, I don't think I want that cross. And then they go up the other side. And each door is, no, I don't think I want that one. Finally, they get to the last room. And he, the angel opens the door. He looks inside. And in the corner, there's a tiny little white plastic cross with a pink bow on it sitting there in the corner. And the man said, that's the cross I want. And the angel looks at him real surprised, and he said, but that's the cross the angels took off your back when you got here. I thought it was a good illustration of, yeah, how the burdens we have in life and the trials that we undergo, they can seem so hard. Now imagine what it was like when our Annas Anabaptist forefathers were burned alive at the stake or had screws put in their, their tongues and tortured in all kinds of ways, or the early Christians, or a lot of other Christians through the centuries. It makes our crosses look pretty small in comparison. What do you think they would think if they knew about the grumbling we do on, oh yeah, life is so hard, the Christian life is, is so tough, and they went through all of these things, and they're like, what? What are you complaining about? And I think it helps us to put things in perspective that, that very few of us have had the ultimate crosses um, at, at all. And, but there's going to be some kind of cross, and uh, we can take it joyfully, as did so many who ended up suffering horribly for Jesus Christ, and yet they did it with joy, or we can, we can do it with bitterness. The choice is ours. Step three is to not believe, if you still do, in the myth of, quote, hurting people. And I don't mean to be unkind. I don't know if that phrase is still used a lot nowadays. Um, uh, perhaps it is. Perhaps it is. it has moved on. I certainly heard of it a lot in the 1980s, 1990s, and, and, and that. About, you know, so and such and such a person. Oh, that poor person. Yeah, she's a real hurting person, you know. And from my observation in life is most hurting people are unforgiving people. They're hurting because they haven't forgiven. Now, again, I don't mean to be unsympathetic. People do go through some tough trials, and people have had some very wrong things done to them. Look at what all was done to the Apostle Paul. In fact, all of the apostles. Did they go around? Were they hurting people? Was Paul someone who went around, you know, oh, I'm, I'm so hurting. People have done this and that to me. He would have had, in one sense, every right. I mean, people did all kinds of wrong things to him. But that isn't how Paul was. He was always living victorious. It was always like, what can I do for, for, for Christ today? It wasn't, oh, I want to think about all the wrongs that people have, have done to me. But when we don't forgive, yeah, we're like the, the, the ones in the, in the story that Leo Tolstoy wrote. I just, you know, 
this wrong was done to me, and, and I'm going to get even with him. And, I, and, and if you can't get even, you're going to just sit, and you're going to just think about it, and think about it, and think about it, how rotten this was that this person did this to you. And, and you make yourself bitter, and, and you, you gain nothing. And we certainly want to be sympathetic with people's uh, hurts and, and want to be a source of comfort, but you're not a real source of comfort if you let a person just wallow in self-pity indefinitely. I mean, there's a time for someone to, to need to cry, to, to, to need to just get the hurts out and, and that sort of thing, and we want to be there for that. But, yeah, when it just goes on and on, yeah, it's not really a hurting person. It's an unforgiving person, and that's... And they're hurting themselves. And if we encourage that, we're just making life harder for, for them. It is such a load to go through life carrying unforgiveness, to carry bitterness. It's the, one of the heaviest loads that you can go through life with. Eleanor Roosevelt once said, no one can hurt you without your consent. She didn't mean nobody can wrong you without your consent. That's easy enough to do. No one can really hurt you you have to decide how you're going to respond and feel. And if you forgive, look at Jesus Christ. Did he come out of the grave a hurting person? Did he go around, oh boy, I'm going to get even with those people. Did you see what those Pharisees did to me? Did you hear them mock me when I was on the cross? Oh, that, that was all gone. I mean, you know, he forgave them before he ever died. That, that, that was all gone. You know? We need to follow his example and, and be the same way. I want you to just picture uh, in your mind when I was uh, coming in uh, this afternoon into the church building. This didn't happen, but uh, just uh, let's pretend that uh, Wendell decided to trip me. He didn't like my message this morning, and so okay, that's what I think in your message, David. So he, he trips me as I as I walk in. Okay. Well, I'd have the choice to get up and walk in the church, or I could just lay there. Now imagine that I just decide I'm going to lay there. And you, you come up after lunch and, and the rest period, and you see me lay there in front of the, the door of the church. David, are you, are you okay? Can I help you out? Man, Wendell stumbled me. Man, that's why I'm here. Okay, well, you want some help getting up? To understand this man was a stumbling block. I'm, I've been stumbled. Okay, so you, you, you come in and, and you keep waiting for me to come in and speak, and I never do, so finally everybody leaves. You walk out the door. I'm still just laying there, you know, you're having to step over me. Dave, can I help you up? Man, I've been stumbled. Didn't you hear me? So you all, you all leave and think, well, we won't, <laughs> won't ever invite him back as a speaker. Well, then you come back tomorrow morning. I'm still laying there. Been there all night, you know. Dave, are you okay? Can we get you something? We need to call an ambulance. I've been stumbled. Man, that brother stumbled me. That's why I'm laying here. Don't you understand? I've been stumbled. Church is over tomorrow. <laughs> you step back, go back out. By now, you're all using the other door because you're tired of having to step over me. And I just lay here for months, you, you know. And the rain, the, the snow, whatever. I'm, I'm, yeah, David's laying there in front of in front of the, the church door. I've been stumbled, you know. That's so often what we do. Somebody stumbled us. It was bad. And maybe they were in church leadership. They did something that was very unloving or, or hypocritical or harsh or who knows what. You know, we thought they did this. Maybe they didn't even do it, you know. And so, yeah, they stumbled us. So we just stay the rest of our life stumbled. Yeah, so-and-so did such and such back eh, about 28 years ago. And yeah. I've never recovered. He's, he stumbled me. Well, you know, it's really as dumb. It's just my, my lying out there on the platform. Okay, you've been stumbled. Okay, someone tripped you up. Okay, but you got to get up, you know, and, and get over it and forgive. And you'll be so much more joyful than laying out there in the rain and the snow and all of that, the heat, because someone stumbled you. I've met oh, a number of people in my lifetime in all kinds of churches, and yeah, they've been stumbled, and they stay stumbled the rest of their life, and they don't want to get over it, because it's too fun to talk about how they were stumbled, and, you know, and, and to get sympathy and, and all of that. So, yeah, if we're a hurting person, if we're a stumbled person, yeah, it's time to forgive. If you see yourself in, that, in, that, in those shoes, forgive, 
get over it, and you will be so much happier that you did that. Another thing that's important to remember, we know we should forgive and, you know, we're bitter because we're not forgiving, but that God's forgiveness to us is conditional. And so many Christians don't realize this. It's not taught in most churches. It's taught by Jesus Christ. I want to give you a story about forgiving. I think you'll recognize what parable this is based on. It's about a man named Wilbur Flintwinch. He worked at Pembroke's department store for actually 30 years. Uh, worked his way up from being a sales clerk, or do you say sales clerk, uh, here in the British Isles? But anyway, um, um, he's, he's you know, moved up the ladder now. He's the head of the department. He has people he hires and fires and, and all of that. Things are going really well for him. And then one day he hears that the president of the company wants to meet with him in his office. He thinks, oh, I'm going to get a raise maybe, you know, another promotion or, or, or something. He's all excited. He's going up the stairs to the president's office. And he stops for a moment and he thinks, hmm, I wonder if he's found out my secret. Well, he goes on ahead, nah, I don't think so. Well, he goes in the office. The president is, is there and also his, his uh, immediate boss is there. And... Uh, the president says, uh, Flintwich, I want you to sit down here in this chair. Um, he does that and uh, says, I'm going to get right to the point, Flintwich. You've been stealing for our company, from our company for 30 years. We've had enough of it, and we're letting you go. Flintwich says, okay, there's got to be a mistake here. Me? Steal from Pembroke's? You guys have treated me so well. I mean, I've worked here now for 30 years. You've given me raises. You pay me well. I'm able to take care of my family. What kind of person would I be to steal from the company? I mean, what's this based on? And he said, well, we've discovered that uh, you've been entering phony refunds uh, uh, from the cash register and pocketing the money. Mr. Flintwood says, me? Okay, there's got to be some mistake here. Show me one of these phony refunds that you're talking about. So the president hands him one. He looks at this. He says, well, this has employee number 107863 on it. That's not my number. I knew there was a mistake. And the president says, we know it's not your number. That number belongs to a Nancy Rawlings. But I did some checking, and there's no such person as Nancy Rawlings who works for us. Which says, okay, but why blame me? He says, well, we wouldn't have. Uh, we saw that this was happening, but we couldn't figure out who was doing it. And so you, we didn't suspect you, and you would have gotten away with it. But you got too greedy. And one morning, uh, there was a, a refund issued at 8.35 a.m. And our store doesn't open until 9 o'clock a.m. And so we got suspicious, okay. Uh, and we looked at the security camera to see who was here at 8.35 issuing a refund. And guess what? It was you on the security camera. You're a crook, and I'm going to call the police. And then with that, the president picked up the phone, and Mr. Flintwich lunged across the desk, please, please, don't, don't call the police, don't call the police. And he kept begging and, and begging. Finally, the president put down the phone and said, all right, all right, if you'll give us back the money, we'll, I won't call the police. We'll just let it, let it go. Uh, you're fired, but, but uh, I, won't, I won't prosecute you. Mr. Flintwin said, but I don't have the money. The president looked at him, you don't have the money. You've stolen a million dollars over the last 10 years. What do you mean you don't have the money? I don't have it. I spent it all, you know. I mean, there was <coughs> children's camp and, and there was, uh, you know, private school for our children and eating out and vacations. And I don't know. It's just all gone. I, I, I don't have the money. Well, I'm sorry. You're just going to have to go to the police then. And so the president picked the phone back up again. And Mr. Flintwich, oh, <laughs> begs him again. Please don't do it. Please don't do it. He's, you know, hanging on, on him. And 
crying and, and everything else, and the, and the president finally, all right, the biggest sucker in the world, but all right, I won't call the police. You don't have to pay back the money, but just get out of here. I don't want to ever see you again. Mr. Flintwinch says, oh, you are so nice. You are the kindest person in the world. The president says, you mean the biggest sucker in the world. <laughs> no, no, you are so kind, so kind and wonderful. I doubt there's anybody on this earth who's as nice and kind as you are. He said, I just have one little favor to ask you, and I, I have no right to ask it. The other president said, uh, he said, could I please keep my job? I, I promise I'll work twice as hard as I ever did, and, and the company will get back all the money I, I, I took just in the extra time I put in and the hard work that I, that I do. He said, it's right to punish me. I deserve it, but think of my family. They have no other means of support. We have a recession going on right now. I won't be able to get another job. You know, please think of them, you know. Now this went on and went on and went on. And finally the president said, okay, I won't call the police. I won't make you pay back the money. And you can keep your job. But get out of my office before I change my mind. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And yeah, he, he left. And I think, whew, boy, that was a close one. And he was true to his work. He really worked hard. And boy, on the bus home every day and in the morning, you tell people, boy, Pembroke, that's the nicest place to work for that. I mean, Mr. Pembroke is the greatest guy on earth. I mean, it's where I, I try to do my shopping, and, and uh, I can't talk enough about, about this store, just how good it is. And uh, he really, really worked hard, you know, just like he said he would. But one day, this was a couple months after this happened, he noticed one of the employees un underneath him, uh, Fernando Rodriguez. He noticed him leaving the store, and he had something in his pocket. I don't have it here. And, uh, hmm. He followed him out to his car, and uh, uh, Mr. Rodriguez was about to get his car, and suddenly he noticed Flintwich behind him. He said, oh, Mr. Flintwich, hi, I didn't expect to see you here, hi. Uh, is there anything I can help you with? Flintwich looked at him and said, what's that in your pocket? In my pocket? You mean this, this pack of sugar? You know that's what I mean. You stole that from the company break room, didn't you? Stole it from the break room? I mean, I guess it came from the break room, but I mean, I, I didn't steal it. I mean, I don't need sugar. We've got lots of sugar at home. Yeah, I bet you do. I bet they're all in little white packages, just like this. It says Pembroke on it. No, sir. I mean, why would I want to steal from Pembroke's? I don't know. We've been good to you, but some people are just like that. But, but Mr. Uh, Flintwich, this is totally an accident. I remember now what happened. I was, you know, I like to put two packs of sugar in, in my tea, and, and uh, I was about to, to put the second package in, and, you know, Bob Smith came up and started talking to me, and I, I guess I put it in my pocket without even thinking about it, you know, but I didn't mean to steal it. Well, you should have thought about that before you stole from the company. As you know, we have a zero tolerance policy towards employee theft. In short, you are fired, Rodriguez. We'll mail your last paycheck to you. But Mr. Flintwich, you can't do that over something that small. Think about my family. There's a recession going on right now. They depend on me for their livelihood. I mean, you can't just fire me like, like that. Here, you take the pack of sugar back. Flintwich backed up. Wait a minute, you're trying to bribe me? <laughs> no, I'm not trying to bribe you. Just trying to give you this back. I don't want any stolen goods. Just get in your car and leave. You are fired. That's the end of it. And with that, Flintwich turned around, walked back in the store. Well, what do you think? Sounds pretty absurd, doesn't it? But you know, that's exactly what every one of us is if we don't forgive our fellow man. It doesn't matter what they did to us, that whatever we owe God is like the million dollars that Flintwich stole, and what our brother or sister did to us or our neighbor is like this pack of sugar that in return. It doesn't seem that way. 
It seems like our sins are like this pack of sugar that, you know, you know, God, we expect that he'll forgive us. And, yeah, what our brother or sister did, now that's like a million dollars. But, yeah, it's just the reverse. It's going to always be just the reverse. Jesus said, and I, I think you all recognize the parable of the unforgiving uh, servant. At the end of it, it says, Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant. This is the one who was forgiven this huge sum of money and then wouldn't forgive his fellow slave this little bit of money. And the master said, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. And Jesus says this. Now listen to this. So my heavenly Father also will do to you, to, to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. When I said that forgiveness is conditional, some of you looked at me a little, a little bit strange, and, and I know it's not something uh, that is taught in, in probably most churches, but it's what Jesus taught. And in that parable, the king, and, and one of them, and one is he's the master, he forgave that man's debt and yet, when that man wouldn't forgive his fellow servant, the king reinstated it, and the master reinstated it. And he says, my father will do likewise to each of you if from your heart you do not each of you forgive one another for each other's debts. So he's telling us, if we will not forgive, then God's forgiveness of our sins was for, uh, conditional. That he's going to reinstate that. It's not me teaching that. It's not my, my doctrine. That's Jesus Christ's own words. In fact, when he taught us the Lord's Prayer, you know, he taught us to, to pray, forgive, forgive us our sins as we forgive, uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. He didn't give us any right to just ask forgiveness, but it's forgiveness as we forgive our debtors. And then at the end, just to drive home the point, he said... Uh, so my heavenly Father, well, uh, if you do not forgive uh, the sins of your fellow man, neither will my heavenly Father forgive your sins, in case we didn't get the point. So our being forgiven is conditioned on our being a forgiving person. And so we are writing our own death sentence when we hold on to, to bitterness and, and unforgiveness. Okay, so I, I've mentioned four steps here. The fifth one is recognizing that you, you may not be innocent. You know, we've been talking to this point about innocent Christians. You, you've done absolutely nothing and someone has done something wrong to you. And yet we still don't have a right to be bitter, to be unforgiving. But I've noticed through life that so many people who are bitter or who are hurting or, or whatever are often people... They've done plenty of hurting to other people themselves. Yeah, they feel hurt, but they, they do a lot to hurt other people in the process. And yet they don't want to forgive others, and yet they've done so much wrong themselves. And so I think if we ever, one of the steps in learning to forgive is to recognize, you know, we do just as much wrong as other people do to us. And even if the person who has maybe wronged us, maybe we didn't do anything to them, or at least in our mind. But I guarantee you there's somebody else that we have done wrong things to. And, and so we always have the basis and, and the obligation to be a forgiving person. I thought a lot about, I mentioned this morning I grew up a Jehovah's Witness and, and uh, my wife and I were very devoted, dedicated Jehovah's Witnesses and um, model uh, members of our congregation, etc. Yeah, the, the minute I left, I was suddenly just a, a dirty dog, you know, you know and uh, uh, Deborah left a few months after I did, and, and uh, shockingly, I mean, I was one of the elders in the church, and, and uh, like I say, had been a, a, a model uh, uh, leader, and suddenly they were suggesting to her, maybe I was carrying on an affair with somebody, and people were, were saying uh, that I was uh, involved in demon worship, and all, all kinds of just nutty stuff, you, you know, that they were saying about me, telling other people these things about me. 
the irony is I wasn't guilty of any of the things they've, they've accused me of. But there's so many sins in my life that they don't know about that I am guilty of. That if they only knew, they would have every they could denounce me for those things. And I've thought about that a, that a lot. You know, they could, they could be going around saying, you know, David is really an impatient person, or, or David is really this or that. That would that would be true. They just don't know all of all of my you know dirty linen, dirty linen, and so they're saying all of these things that aren't aren't the least bit true. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can't say I'm innocent, that I don't deserve to be denounced, uh, just not for the things that, <laughs> that they're denouncing me for, but yeah, I, I have my, my faults, and I think if we realize that about ourselves, whatever people might be saying about us or upset about us or have done, that yeah, we've got plenty of sins that we probably deserve that, uh, or even worse, from, from, from God, uh, if, if only everybody knew uh, Everything there is to know about us that God does know. Finally, and this this really helped me. For years, I was very bitter at Jehovah's Witnesses. I, I felt like, oh boy, it's really messed up my life growing up with them, and and uh, uh, and then you know they were saying all these things about me, and 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 this and that, and I just went on, you know, for several years, just really bitter and and uh, and, and unforgiving, trying to think of ways I could get even with them and 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 stuff. And one day I, I, I read something uh, in the writings of, of uh, Francis of Assisi, um, just another way of, of explaining what the Bible teaches, um, that just somehow it, it really drove home the, the, the point to me. He, uh, he and, he and, and uh, some of his disciples were walking along one day, and he asked them, do you know who your best friends are? And they said, uh, people who stick with you through thick and thin. And he said, well, those are certainly good friends, but no, they're not your best. And they tried to think of, you know, uh, other things, people who help you when you're in need, people who do this or that. And he said, yeah, but those are good friends, but they're not your best friend. And he said, you know, who? And, and they, they finally gave up. Well, we don't know who, who's our best friend. And he said, it's the people who, when they should do this to you, they do just the opposite. They do something very wrong to you, very mean to you, very unkind when they should be kind to you. The people who lie about you when they should be telling the, 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 the truth. He said, because if you forgive them, you have a great reward in heaven. These other people who are nice to you, who help you out when you're in need and all, and all of that, sure, you like them, you love them and all that, and there's no reward in heaven for that. But to love those who do wrong to you, there's a reward in heaven. So those are your best friends. If you forgive them and love them, despite what they've done to you, then they have done you the biggest favor possible. You're going to have a reward in heaven because of them. And you know, when I read that, I thought, wow, I had never thought of things that way. I started thinking about Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, hey, that's great that they're lying about me and saying all kinds of things about me. Just, yeah, pour it on, and I'll try to just say as much true and nice about them as, as I can. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, false things there that I'm not going to cover up. But, uh, yeah, I, I try not to just go around uh, uh, denigrating Jehovah's Witnesses or running them down. Some people actually get a little upset with me that I, I'm not as harsh on them as they think I, I should be. But I've just always remembered that, that, you know, I'm going to try to return evil good for, for evil, uh, be forgiving, try to point out what is good there, what is true there, and th that just took such a load off my back when I started looking at, th at things that, that way, and I, I just am grateful that, that Francis shared that. So let's just quickly go through those six steps, and, and then I think you all are ready to get out of this warm building. Okay, so the first one was recognizing that bitterness is a choice, that um, we can either forgive or we can be bitter. And, and that is our decision of what we're going to do. Number two is understanding that God gives us a cross for a reason. That he tests us through these trials that come. It doesn't mean that he causes other people to do evil to us. But he will use that as a, as a test. And, and so we should expect a cross in life. And most of us are blessed to have pretty light crosses. Number three 
was to quit believing in this myth of hurting people or a stumbled person. If you're hurting, if you're stumbled, if this goes on and on, you're just not forgiving. And that's the problem. And you need to look at it that way. Number four was understanding that God's forgiveness is conditional. If you're not going to forgive others, God is not going to forgive you. And you are really doing yourself the, the greatest harm that you could possibly do, that anyone could possibly do to you by not forgiving. Number five, recognize that you may not be innocent. In most quarrels, in most conflicts, it's nearly always both sides have fault. Even if you are totally innocent in one situation, you're not innocent in all situations. So someone may be saying something about you that's not true, but if they knew everything about you, they, they would have plenty to probably talk about, So, or whatever the situation may be. So I think when we recognize, yeah, we are sinners, we do fall short, and uh, yeah, if, if we're wronged, uh, we really have no cause to complain because we've wronged other people. And finally, recognize that those who wrong us are actually blessing us if we will just love them in return, repay evil evil for their, repay good for their evil, and we'll find out they've actually are our best friends. All right, any quick questions before we get to, to uh, step outside into the nice cool breeze? Okay, good. I thought we wouldn't have any questions. Oh, okay. Yes, brother. <laughs> start with Jesus. What, what did he say? And yes, when we are um, baptized, all of our past sins, when we're born again, all of our past sins are forgiven, okay? So Jesus has forgiven us our past sins. He doesn't forgive our future sins. Now, most churches, or at least evangelical churches, teach, teach that your future sins are also pre-forgiven. Jesus never said that, okay? So he forgave us first, okay? Our past sins were forgiven, okay? So from that point on, yeah, we are to forgive as he forgave us, and then each day as he forgives us, you know, but if we stop forgiving, then he doesn't forgive, you, you know. Now, I'm sure Christ is, is maybe more merciful than the way he put it, but uh, I don't think it's our place to test him and, and just see, okay, I'm not going to forgive, and we'll, let's, let's see. Because he said you're not going to be forgiven. So, so, yeah, Paul is just saying, yeah, as Christ... He forgave us at the beginning. We didn't have to, you know, earn his forgiveness. We didn't have to make any amends to him. And he forgave us. And that's the way that we should be. But we have to keep doing it. It's not a pre-forgiveness for all of our future sins. Okay? Hebrews, Hebrews says that, in Hebrews it says, it makes it very clear that he gives us the means to, to be forgiven. Yeah. I'm just stressing what you right. said. Yes, yes. I, and I understand it. Thank you. Yes. Okay. And, and, yeah, if you want to chat some more about it afterwards, do you want to close with a song prayer? John will close. All right. Sean? John. 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 Okay, John, I will turn it over to you.